Well, good morning, everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Rosa Center. And for those of you who perhaps this is your first time at this event, a very special welcome. And for those of you who are returning attendees, nice to see you again and welcome back. On behalf of the University of Calgary and the McCaig Institute for Bone and Joint Health, welcome to the Wood Forum 2023 Build Better Bones. <laughs> I indeed, right? Yes, build better bones. I'm Lisa Bose. I'm your MC for today, and it's a pleasure to be back with you again. Just briefly, I am a, a longtime sports journalist, uh, a kinesiology graduate from many, many moons ago, and I'm also the author of the Lucy Tries Sports Children's Book Series, where the mission is to encourage all our kids to be active and to persevere and to realize the benefits of sport so they can lead healthier and happier lives. And it is a real pleasure to be asked back as your MC. I take away so much information from these forums that I, I truly uh, cherish. I, I learn so much and I take them back, uh, not only for myself, but for my family and hopefully uh, for my mom who is watching online, as I know many more of you are watching online and welcome to you as well. To begin, it is important that we honor the indigenous lands where the University of Calgary is situated. Located in the heart of southern Alberta, we both acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation region of, of Alberta, region number three. Just a few housekeeping and technical notes for you before we proceed. So for all of you who are here with us at the Rosa Center, the bathrooms are located past the coat check by the main entrance. And we understand that sitting for long durations can be uncomfortable. So please do feel free to stand up at any point during the presentations if you need. It's, it's very casual in that sense. So please do feel free to stand up if you need to. To our virtual audience joining us today, welcome. And below the video screen, you will find the event program, which will include more information about our speakers. And you'll also notice a Q&A box to the right of the screen. And this is where you can submit your questions for our Q&A panel, which will be happening a little bit later in our presentation. While we encourage questions, they will be addressed during the Q&A panel at the end, so not in between presentations. For any technical issues that you may have, click on the technical support tab and follow the instructions that you see there. For those of us who are here in person, feel free to jot down your questions and save them for the Q&A portion. Please note that our speakers will be happy to answer your questions, but they will be unable to offer specific medical advice. Lastly, today's presentations will be recorded and the recording will be shared on YouTube and the McCaig Institute website after the event. Today's Wood Forum is an initiative supported through the Wood Joint Research Fund. Now this fund was generously established by Dr. John and Mrs. Christina Wood in 1998 and is continued by their daughter, Dr. Donna Wood, in their honor. And we are happy to welcome members of the family here today. Among them are Dr. Donna Wood, as well as Mrs. Christina Wood's sister, Margaret Southern. So wonderful to see you here, Mrs. Southern, 92 years young, and thank you so much for being here, and also Dr. Donna Wood, thank you. This annual forum is designed to bring the public and researchers together. It's an opportunity to explore the impacts of bone and joint diseases and injuries and to stay informed about the current advancements in related research. So thank you again to the Wood family for making this happen so that all of us can understand more truly about our bones, our joints, about our bodies as we continue this journey of life. Before we get into the program today, I would like to welcome the director of the McCaig Institute for Bone and Joint Health, Dr. Stephen Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a professor in the Department of Radiology in the Cummings School of Medicine. He holds joint appointments in the Schulich School of Engineering and the Faculty of Kinesiology. His research focuses on the adaptive changes in bone that occur following a joint injury or disease. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Boyd.
Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to everybody here who's at our annual uh, Wood Forum and to all those who are online as well. I, I understand there's quite a few people online. Um, before I get going, I wanted to say a thanks to Lisa as well. Lisa's been volunteering her time for this event for a number of years now, and she's really the glue that brings it all together to make such a wonderful event. So thank you, Lisa. Um, as Lisa said, I'm a professor in the Department of Radiology here at the University of Calgary. I'm a biomedical engineer, and I'm the director of the McKaig Institute for Bone and Joint Health. For those of you who don't know, the McKaig Institute is one of the key institutes within the University of Calgary that is uh, focused on maintaining mobility for Albertans, and by extension, all Canadians, uh, without pain-free mobility for all Canadians. Um, the focus of the Institute is work in the area of arthritis, uh, inflammatory arthritis, osteo osteoarthritis, and osteoporosis. We also do work in the area of performance. So we work with the national figure skating team, for example. Uh, we work with astronauts who are going up to the International Space Station. So there's quite a breadth of work that happens within the McKaig Institute, and it's all focused towards keeping us all mobile for long term. Um, Mobility is one of those things that once you, when you lose it, you realize how important it is. And I can speak about that a little bit from personal experience. About three years ago, I was out mountain biking with my friends, and I fell off my bike and broke my hip. So it was a femoral neck fracture. And lying in the bed for the first time in my life, I had sort of contemplated how important mobility was to me. And I'm sure it's important to everybody else here. So since then, I've, I've recovered quite well. Uh, but I know how important it is to be able to go for a day skiing at Lake Louise, or if you want to go for a walk along the Bow River, or if you just simply want to enjoy a day or two of pain-free movement of your joints. All of that is super important for our day-to-day -day lives, and I think sometimes it does, isn't fully appreciated, um, the relevance of that to, of, to us all. So the McKaig Institute is a collection of scientists, uh, clinicians, faculty, staff, students, all working toward this goal. We've got connections, strong connections here within Calgary, but beyond Calgary to Alberta and to all, by extension, connections all across Canada. So it's a real gem to have this here, I think, in the city of Calgary. One of the um, uh, years ago, this, the Institute was formed by Bud McKaig and Cy Frank and some others coming together to, with this concept of developing a research facility, research entity for bone and joint health. Bud and Sai have passed since then, but their legacy lives on, I think, in this wonderful institute. Um, this, the ability to host these kinds of events and to bring the science that we are doing within the institute into a public forum is only possible through events like this. The Wood family has been supporting this for years. And as we were noting, we've got uh, representatives of the Wood family here, as well as representatives of the McKaig family, keeping this legacy alive going forward. So I'm very excited to uh, have this event again. Uh, it's a topic that's of particular interest to me. Um, I would also invite all of you to participate in research, to be involved. And if you look in your little grab bag, there's a little business card in there that says Mobility for Life. If you're interested, sign up, and you can actually be part of the research that happens within the Institute. So with that, I'll pass it on, because I'm looking forward to these talks. And I'm just going to give one final piece of advice as I step off the stage is, don't break your hip. So <laughs> take care, everybody. Excellent advice. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. <laughs> Well, today we have a lineup of four experts who will shed light on the most recent research breakthroughs in enhancing bone health. We all depend on the strength and health of our bones to navigate through our daily lives and partake in activities that we love. Whether it's engaging in a sport, playing with our children or grandchildren, pursuing a hobby, or just simply carrying out routine tasks. When our bone health is compromised, we all know it significantly impacts our quality of life. Thankfully, there are dedicated individuals who devote their careers to understanding and enhancing bone health, and we are so fortunate to hear from them at the Wood Forum today. To begin our program, I would like to first welcome to you, you, 
to Dr. Lee Gable. She will enlighten us about the significance of bone health during childhood and adolescence, as well as the vital role physical activity and exercise play in cultivating a healthy skeleton. Dr. Gable is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology, and her research is largely centered on crucial life stages for bone accrual, such as childhood and adolescence and bone loss during menopause. I'll be listening to that in particular. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Gable as she shares her research and insights on the pivotal role of physical activity and exercise in promoting healthy bone development throughout our lives. Dr. Gable. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you to everybody for being here today. Uh, my talk is titled Planting the Seeds for Healthy Bone Development. So I thought I should start with a picture of a connection to the land. And actually, I'm going to use this to talk about how we can learn about building healthy bones from this windswept tree. This windswept tree and the ones around it are pretty near and dear to my heart. This is an image from Beausoleil Island on the rocky shores of Georgian Bay in Ontario. I spent a number of years here uh, at a summer camp and then working as a summer camp counselor. But I'm sure you all can envision that image of a windswept tree, whether it was hiking in Kananaskis or along the windy uh, plains of the foothills. Uh, what can we learn about trees? Well, trees, are, and most of their features are largely determined by their genetics. So we can tell this is a pine tree. It looks a lot like other pine trees. It looks a lot like the upright pine tree that you would find in the neighboring dense forest. But it's also susceptible to its environment. So the water, the sun, the soil, and particularly the forces it experiences while it's growing up. So we know that this windswept tree grew this way because it was pushed on by the wind as it was growing. So growing trees adapt to their environment. And like trees, your bones adapt to their environment. So your skeleton, the density, the size, the strength, is largely determined by your genetics. So you can thank your biological parents for a lot of those factors, but it is also susceptible to the environment. There's a number of factors we could talk about today, but I'm gonna talk about one, and that is movement, how you move your body. And across your life, your bones are continually adapting to the way that you move. And particularly during childhood and adolescence, they are really adaptable and really susceptible to the way that you are moving. And that's where I'm gonna start with today. So before we begin, why do we care about building better bones? I'm sure you can think of a few good reasons for your skeleton. One, it supports you. It's the reason that you can move around. It's an attachment site for muscles, so those muscles allow you to move. It also uh, serves protection, so it protects your vital organs. It protects your brain. Your bone marrow live in your bones, so they produce red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and it's also a reservoir for minerals. So an example of this is the growing fetus. So the, the baby develops a skeleton. It needs calcium to do that. And it actually borrows, or more appropriately, steals some of that calcium from mom's skeleton. So of that 1,000 milligrams that you're recommended to intake every day, near the later stages of pregnancy, that baby is appropriately stealing about a third of it. So we know moms are really generous and unselfish, but this starts right from the get-go. And then even more, lactation, breast milk. What is milk made of? Calcium. Where do you think that comes from? So mom's diet, but also from that reservoir of calcium in the skeleton. So we know that bone plays a really, really crucial role in many different functions. Okay, now this is the audience participation of the talk. Given how important your skeleton is and how many roles it serves to play, how much do you think your bones weigh? Either think of a number in kilograms, or what percentage of your total body mass represents your bone. 
I'll give you a second to think about it, and then if any brave souls would mind venturing a guess, please go ahead. 10%? Okay, and any others? Yep. 30%. 45. Those are wonderful guesses. Do you know what? It's actually only about 3 to 5% of your total body mass. So maybe only 2 to 3 kilograms of bone mineral. You could hold that in your hand. What is the rest of your body? Uh, well, if you're um, a young male, so an 18-year-old male, for example, about 80% of your body mass would be lean mass. So that's muscle. Those are your organs. Those are fluid. Then you have about 15% body fat, and the remaining 5% bone mineral. Uh, for a female of the same age, about 70% lean mass, so muscle, organs, fluids, about 27% body fat, and then 3% bone mass. So we actually don't have a lot of bone mineral in the body, and it serves really important function. So absolutely, we're interested in building better bones. So now I'm going to come back to uh, the purpose of my talk, and that's to talk about movement and movement during childhood and adolescence. I'm going to show you a video of a young gymnast who I know quite well. And gymnastics is a sport that we tend to think about when we're thinking about movements that help build a strong skeleton, because we know that gymnasts have denser and strong bones. So what do you see happening here? We're seeing a lot of impact. An impact is when your body experiences a load greater than your body weight. And these loads squish the bone, and that sends a message to the bone to get stronger. The body and the bones need to be squished in order to get stronger, and we sometimes refer to this as overload. So we need squishing our load over and above what is normal or what the bone is expecting in order to encourage it to grow stronger. And we know that you don't have to be a competitive gymnast to reap the benefits. Even recreational gymnasts tend to have denser and stronger bones than non-gymnasts just by virtue of how they're moving your body. The other cool thing about gymnastics is look at this movement, the loading on the arms. There are very few other times in life where we're actually putting that much load on the upper body. Can you recall the last time you were even hanging from your arms or trying to, to, to push up with your full body weight? So this is something really unique to gymnastics. Now, you don't have to be a gymnast to reap these types of benefits. You can find these movements in everyday life, during free play, when kids are given the opportunity to. You can see the impact, the squishing of the bone. And bone needs this squishing in order to grow strong. Now, I often think about whether um, kids innately know they need this type of movement, because whenever given the opportunity, you'll find them jumping on things they're not supposed to. Right, so I've, I've convinced myself that they just know their body needs this movement. It's not that they want to um, sort of bug me by continuing to jump on the things they're not, not meant to. Um, another place we often see these movements happening is when we get outdoors. Kids rarely take the easy path. They're climbing on top of rocks. They're jumping off them. They're exploring their environment. And in this video here, this is not our first trip to the park. This is not the first time um, my son is jumping off of tall things, but this is the first time he's climbed this high uh, and gained the confidence to go for this type of a jump. <laughs> and he ends up going up for more, and his comment is, Whoa. And, you know, the whole time during this, I'm trying not to say, watch out, be careful, because, you know, I don't want to stop him from doing it. Um, if, the, if the volume was there, I, you would have just heard me say, like, how are you feeling about this, buddy? And he was like, good, I'm good, right? So um, this type of movement is really key to building strong bones. Uh, jumping is a really nutrient-dense type of movement. Let's take a look at another sport that you might be familiar with. 
And uh, tennis, or any type of racket sport, is really interesting because you get this repetitive loading. So back and forth. But what's particularly unique about it is that it only happens on one side of your body. So it's unilateral. So we can look at differences in, in how bones adapt in the playing arm versus the non-playing arm. So this is uh, a CT image of the upper arm, the humerus, showing the bone in one female tennis player. Can you guess which arm is the dominant arm? Yeah, it's pretty obvious, right? It's a lot larger, wider bones. Um, and this brings up the concept of specificity. So uh, bone adaptation is specific to, to the bone that is being loaded. And tennis players and racket sport players make this really clear. We're going to stay on the tennis, tennis playing theme right now. What I'm showing you is um, some data from side to side differences in bone, in bone strength in adult females. So an adult female who did not play tennis is indicated here as a control. So this would be someone like me. I probably have a 5% difference between my right and my left arm just by virtue of using my dominant arm more. Now, if we look at side to side differences in tennis players, these would be tennis players who started not in, in old age, but they started after puberty. So they started in their late teens or in their 20s. And we can see that the side to side differences that they have are much greater than you and I who aren't tennis players. But then when we look at side-to-side -side differences in adult females who started playing before puberty, we're seeing up to 25% or greater bone strength in the arm that was being loaded. Now, these data come from people of the same age who train for the same number of years. The only difference is that training was initiated before puberty or during late childhood, early adolescence. So this brings up the concept not only of specificity, but also of timing. And the timing of loading matters, and there's what we call a window of opportunity in childhood and adolescence, where kids are really receptible and responsive to this type of impact and squishing. Why is this the case? So I'll show two slides um, illustrating how bones grow. And these are data from uh, the University of British Columbia Healthy Bone Study, where I did my doctorate. And what we're looking at here is total body bone mineral content from a DEXA scan. So the, the same scan you would go to screening for osteoporosis. And we have data on over 1,000 kids who we followed from childhood right through to early adulthood. And every little line here is an individual child. The girls are in black. The boys are in orange. I was on a bit of a Halloween theme this past week. And uh, the thick black lines would be the average curve for girls, the average curve for boys. And you can see I mentioned we might have about three kilograms of bone mass at adulthood. So this is 3,000 milligrams, or for girls, closer to 2,000 or two kilograms. So a few things you'll notice from this figure. One, boys tend to have, on average, a lot more bone mass as they enter adulthood. And that's largely because they're taller. Um, second, we don't stop gaining bone mass um, until typically our early 20s. So the, the rate at which we accrue it slows down, but we're still gaining bone mass into our early 20s. And then most of this bone mass is being accrued between the ages of about 11 to 15. So sort of this window where a lot of bone is being accrued. And what happens during these years really sets the upper limit for where your bone mass and density will be to see you through a lifetime of loading. So this next slide, these are the same data, but instead of showing you bone mass in grams, I'm showing how fast that bone was being accrued. So we're looking at grams per year of this total body bone content. So we see that in girls. Girls tend to hit their peak of bone mass accrual around age 12. Boys about two years later, around age 14. And this is just because girls tend to enter puberty a couple years earlier than boys. What's pretty interesting is that this peak for boys is about 330 grams per year. Now, total bone mineral content is around 3,000, so that is more than 10% of their total bone mass they're gaining in just one year of adolescence. That's huge. 
When we think about how fast you grow in height, you might only be gaining about 5% of your height when you're growing your fastest, maybe eight or nine centimeters. But we gain so much more bone mass because bone is not only growing to lengthen your bones, but in other places, it's being added to widen your bones and make them more dense, depending on how they are being loaded. Now, there's a lot of variability in terms of when kids enter puberty. So these are just averages, average ages, but it can fluctuate on either side by a few years. But we tend to, to call these periods um, from about 11 to 13 in girls and 13 to 15 in boys as these real windows of opportunity for bone accrual, because it's during these ages, bone is being added its fastest, and it's just primed to adapt to loading. Now, I do want to touch on just one more thing, and that is, I'm often asked, is there such a thing as too much physical activity? We know the benefits of physical activity, but sometimes we be con we're concerned that our kids are engaging in too much. I don't have enough time to go into specificity, sports specialization, uh, or overtraining, but our next speaker, Dr. Edwards, will talk a little bit about that. But I do want to talk briefly about the importance of the menstrual cycle and menstrual function for adolescent girls and young women. So I'm going to talk about two different conditions that are, that are totally different. Um, one is anorexia nervosa. The other is oligoamenorrheic athletes. I'll, I'll tell you what each is, but each is associated with impaired bone strength and a higher risk of fractures. So those with anorexia, um, it's a life-threatening mental illness that's characterized by restrictive eating. So not eating and, and starvation. When the body doesn't have enough energy or, or isn't eating enough and you're growing, you don't have enough energy to build new tissue. So you're not building bone. You also don't have enough energy for reproductive function, so often your menstrual cycle will stop or it'll become irregular. And why that matters is because there is one hormone in particular that is very important for bone health, and that is estrogen. And in women, it is produced primarily in the ovaries during the menstrual cycle. So it gets produced in the follicles. When you are no longer having a cycle or it becomes irregular, estrogen declines and that leads to bone loss and greater risk of fracture. So we know that youth with anorexia tend to have fractures more often than their non-anorexic peers. And then oligomenorrheic athletes. These are athletes in weight-bearing sports, so their skeleton should be strong compared to the average because they've been loading them. But oligomenorrheic means that they had a menstrual cycle at one point, but it is now irregular or it's, it's been absent for several months. Usually in athletes, this, because, this occurs because of not enough energy intake, so not eating enough for the level of activity, or excessive exercise, or too much physical activity, or chronic stress. So again, this leads to a condition that we know is bad for bone. When we think of sports associated with this condition, we often think of those aesthetic sports, so gymnastics, dancing, and figure skating, where leanness is really prioritized. But we also see it in weight class sports, like rowing or boxing, where you have to make weight in order to compete, or in running, where you're carrying your body weight. Um, so in, in these populations, we see that rate of fracture is approximately 40%. So that means 40% of, of the, the youth or young adults have broken a bone. Um, there, there's no difference in rates between the athletes and those with anorexia. And this actually doesn't tell the whole story because many of these have had multiple fractures. Then having multiple fractures puts you at greater risk of having more fractures down the road. And this compares to about 20% in the non-athletic population. So what we see here is that being loading the body through sport cannot protect you from the negative impact of um, estrogen deficiency that's associated with not having a menstrual cycle. So I think this is a really important conversation we need to be having with um, our adolescent girls and young women in terms of the importance of this for bone health. And lastly, I want to leave you with um, a, a, an image of bone health across the lifespan. So we've talked about enhancing bone accrual during childhood and adolescence through movement and moving the body. Into adulthood, we're really talking about maintaining that bone mass 
So just because you gained it during childhood doesn't necessarily mean that it will be maintained. You still have to keep moving your body. And then I have building bone in brackets, because you can build bone as an adult. It's just a lot harder to do so. And then later in life, we think about reducing bone loss and preventing falls. And I want to hone in on one point in particular, and Lisa alluded to this in the introduction. Right here in women at menopause, we see this precipitous decline in bone loss. Now, we usually don't screen for osteoporosis until out until age 65. Um, we know there's a lack of knowledge around women's health in general, but particularly around the menopausal transition, and there's very little guidance what to do in this period to prevent this loss from happening. So I want to put a brief plug that we're just about to start recruiting for a strength training study here in Calgary that will look to see if we can prevent bone loss during peri and early menopause with strength, strength training and impact loading. So I'd love to chat with you afterwards if this is something that might interest you. So with that, I'll come back to the image of the windswept tree. Our skeletons are a lot like trees. Genetics plays a large role in determining our size, strength, density, but our bones are also susceptible to how we move them, and particularly how we move them during childhood and adolescence. So we know how to build better bones. We just need to move them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Dable. Wonderful, and yes, I will chat with you later about uh, a test subject. I'd be happy to be part of that study. Uh, <laughs> I'm now delighted to introduce you to Dr. Brent Edwards, who shares emerging research on optimizing bone health and preventing fractures in adulthood through targeted physical activities. Dr. Edwards holds the position of Research Excellence Chair and Associate Professor within the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary. He also holds joint appointments in the Cummings School of Medicine and the Schulich School of, Schulich School of Engineering. As the co-director of the Human Performance Lab, his research is focused on the fundamental mechanisms of fracture and fatigue in bone associated with mechanical loading and therapeutic drugs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Brent Edwards. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you to the Wood Forum, and thank you to the McCaig Institute for the invitation to, to speak today. So <clears throat> now that Dr. Gable has made you all feel um, terribly guilty about not participating in enough physical activity as a child, um, I'm going to tell you that don't stress. There's some things that we can do during adulthood to, to, to sort of help at least maintain uh, the bone that we do have uh, prevent falls from occurring, and um, in some instances, even build bone, even in older adulthood. Dr. Gable touched on the important mechanical role that bone plays, and so I'm just going to reiterate that. It protects our internal organs. It provides the body its basic shape. It, it facilitates movement. That's one of the most important things that it do, right? It serves as a location for our muscles to attach and pull, and that's the only way that we can move. Uh, and then it provides a framework for support. I, I, I love this image here. So this is an illustration drawn by Adrea, uh, um, <clears throat> Adreas Vesalius, who's often regarded as the godfather of modern anatomy. And I, I love this image because the skeleton just looks like he's in complete anguish. And, and I, I like to think it's because of the, of the large mechanical loads that it has to endure throughout, throughout the lifespan. Um, because of these large mechanical loads, unfortunately, sometimes bones crack or they break, right? And there's different types of fractures. There's what we call a traumatic fracture, and this is, this is going to be caused by, you know, acute, high-energy trauma. These are your fractures that happen because you're skiing or you're in a car accident. <clears throat> then we have fragility fractures, sometimes called pathological fractures. And these are fractures that are caused by minimal trauma in a weak or a, a pathological or a diseased state of bone. This is your, you know, your fall from standing height or lower in an older adult. 
And then we have something called a stress fracture. In older adults, we call them insufficiency fractures. And these are overuse injuries that happen, um, and they're caused by the accumulation of little itty bitty micro trauma that we get inside our bones when we participate in repetitive, cumulative bouts of physical activity. We can get, we can get fractures that way. It's kind of akin, akin to the way sometimes you, know, you take a paper clip and you can work it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until it breaks. That's, that's kind of what happens with a stress fracture, a similar mechanism. <clears throat> um, we can't do a lot, you know, to minimize our chances of these traumatic fractures. We can drive safer, a little bit more defensively. We can pick our activities a little bit wider, wiser. Um, but it's really these two types of fractures, these pathological fractures and these stress fractures, so that we can do things to avoid. Okay. On the simplest sense of a fracture, it really only depends on two things. It's this biomechanical event that only happens when the applied load or the force that's applied to the bone exceeds the bone's strength. It's as simple as that. Force, and if there's no force, then the bone doesn't break. <clears throat> and so what do we mean when we talk about the applied load? Well, what's the applied load dependent on? It's dependent on the activity. Did you fall from standing height? Did you fall while you were running? This is going to change the load. Were you walking the dog and the leash got wrapped around your legs? Which happens all the time. You fall down. That's going to change the applied load. What kind of surface are you walking on? Are you going to fall on ice? Are you falling on the grass? That can change. Um, what about your response time? How quickly can you re react to a fall? Can you do something? Can you take a step to prevent that fall from occurring? So there's no applied load to the bone at all, right? These are, this is what we mean when we talk about the applied load. <clears throat> the other thing that, you know, that we're very interested in is bone strength. And bone strength is dependent, again, on, on multiple different things. Your bone mass, your bone density, the structure, the size, the geometry, and then the material, what's the quality of, of the building blocks of the bone material that the bone, that the bone is made of? These are all in, important things. <clears throat> and so we can intervene to prevent a fracture, essentially through both of these pathways. Try to minimize those loads, or we can try to improve our bone strength. <clears throat> There's really three rules, especially when it comes to adulthood, there's really three rules that are very important to follow when we're worried about adapting our bones, improving our bone strength, or even maintaining the bone strength that we do have. And the first rule is that the load that the bone is exposed to, it has to be dynamic. It can't be static. Standing, this is not a bone building exercise. Okay. Bone likes to be, as Dr. Gable put it, squished. Okay? It likes to be squished through heavy, dynamic, impulsive type of loading. It lives for that. Um, one of the cool things about bone is that you don't need to load it a lot to reap the benefits of physical activity. Um, so only a short duration of loading is necessary because bone becomes, in fact, less responsive to repetitive loading over time. So you really don't have to participate in a lot of physical activity as long as it's dynamic and impulsive and it squishes the bones in order to reap the benefits of physical activity. And then finally, bone cells, they, 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 they accommodate to the customary load. So you need to change it up. It likes variable loading. It likes it when you increase the loading magnitude. If you go to the gym and you do the same bicep curl, Every day, day in and day out, you do the same number of repetitions, you do the same weight. At some point, your muscle's going to say, yeah, I'm used to this. I can do this. It, you're not going to get that muscle atrophy, and bone is the same way. Okay, for a long time, we thought, you can't build bone in older adults through exercise. But that's not really true, especially if you follow these three rules of adaptation. 
This is a study published in 2018 in the top bone journal in the field, and it was the number one downloaded study in this journal in that year. <clears throat> what they did was they took postmenopausal females around 65 years of age, all with low bone mineral density. So they were either osteopenic or osteoporotic, and they randomized them to two different loading groups. You're going to participate in either high intensity resistance and impact training, high resistance training, 80 to 85 percent of your run of what we call your one rep maximum ability, and then impact training. They're dropping from bars onto the ground. Okay, so heavy sort of impulsive type of loading. Or you get randomized to a low intensity exercise program. Low intensity exercise program means you're at home and you're just, you know, you're, you're working against your body weight, you're doing squats. But they only did this program for eight months and only two days per week. The bone doesn't need a lot of it, right? Just two days per week. What they found was that the women participating in the high intensity training had superior gains in bone mass. In fact, significant improvements in bone mass, improvements to bone structure, and nearly every single measurement of physical function. So lower extremity strength, uh, sorry, lumbar spine strength. Um, and then they had, this is time to up and go. So these are measurements of people sitting down in a chair. How fast can you get up? How fast can you walk 10 meters? And these kinds of things. All of these metrics of physical function went up, and they found nearly 4% higher bone mineral density at the spine, 2% higher bone mineral density at the hip. These are the kind of effects that you would expect from taking osteoporosis drug therapies. 30% higher muscle strength. Now, this was intensive physical activity done under very strict supervision of healthcare healthcare professionals. If you are wanting to start doing physical activity to promote your bone health, then I think the first place that I would start is with the new Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. Okay, so you go to Osteoporosis, Google Osteoporosis Canada exercise, and you'll find this, what was just released, too fit to fracture the new Osteoporosis Canada guidelines. And on there, they've got these great recommendations for what you can do to maintain your bone health and maybe just as importantly, or perhaps more importantly, minimize your risk for falling. Remember, we wanna minimize the applied load. What do they recommend? They recommend strength training only two days per week, okay? And this will keep you strong and fit and it'll help build bone. Balance exercises every day walking on your toes, walking on your heels, yoga, tai chi, this will help prevent falls. Postural awareness, working on good posture while you're sitting down or while you're standing, this minimizes loads on the spine. That's why that's important. But then they also recommend at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous type of aerobic weight bearing exercise. You're walking, you're jogging, you're running if you can, you're dancing, and this is gonna improve your, 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 overall, your overall health. And when they say moderate to vigorous type of exercise, we're talking about the type of exercise where you can still carry a conversation maybe with your friend, but just barely, okay? Just barely, you're, you're losing your breath of it. All right, so now I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about something that I really, really love. Because if you are going to take on a new aerobic weight-bearing activity, like walking, like running, like jogging, and you do have to think about overuse injuries, especially if you're not accustomed to participating in a lot of aerobic weight-bearing activity. And one of those overuse injuries that we need to talk about what's called a stress fracture, what I alluded to earlier. <clears throat> so what is a stress fracture? This is a type of overuse injury that occurs, <clears throat> and it happens because repetitive loads when applied to the skeletal system, which is those that you get during walking and running, they cause microtrauma in the bone. Small little cracks that your eyes can't see, 
We're all standing and sitting and walking on cracks in our bones right now. <clears throat> this is a cross-section of bone. In adulthood, bone is comprised of these cylindrical-like structures, which we call osteons, the building block of bone. But when we do repetitive exercise, we get these tiny little cracks that kind of form in between our osteons. And it's not all bad. We all have it. And some even think that those cracks are important for bone adaptation because those cracks can serve as a stimulus for a new bone remodeling unit or a new osteone to form. But if you participate in too much physical activity and, and you don't allow your body enough rest for the bone remodeling process to occur, then you can get these pesky little things that we call stress fractures. And, and, and a lot of them, most of them, they're, 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 they're not threatening, they're not serious, but they're gonna put you out for 12 weeks. And you don't wanna have to do that. But some are serious. Some are serious depending on where they occur and, um, and they do require surgical fixation. So if you are gonna take up a new running regimen or walking regimen, what are some things that you can do to prevent these stress fractures? Probably the most important thing that you can do is you can prioritize volume over intensity, okay? If you start to walk or you start to run, focus on increasing your distance before you start focusing on increasing your speed. And this is because the magnitude of loading, when you increase the magnitude of loading, it starts to increase your risk for stress fracture in this very nonlinear fashion. You get rapid changes in stress fracture risk with changes in loading intensity. But when you focus on distance training first, you increase your distance, then the risk only increases linearly in a one-to-one -one fashion. So focus on increasing the volume before you work on the intensity. Another thing that you can do is you can take shorter strides. Females are at a higher risk of stress fracture than males, and this is particularly true in military recruits. <clears throat> and one of the things that the American and the British military started observing is that, well, the women, on average, are of shorter stature than the males. And they noticed that they were essentially trying to keep pace with the males um, during marching and other type of, you know, ambulatory exercises. And so what did the militaries do? The American and the British militaries, they put a limit on how long strides could be taken during marching exercises, or they actually had the females start to set the pace. And when they had the females start to set the pace during marching exercises, the risk of stress fractures went way down. And that's because when you are overstriding, you're putting an increased load on your skeletal system. So if you're, if you're walking, if you're running with a taller person, with a taller partner, then maybe have the shorter person set the pace. Or work on just decreasing your stride length and increasing your cadence. That'll have added cardiovascular benefits as well. And then finally, maybe one of the other important things that you can do is Pick comfortable shoes. There was a great study in the military where they had the military cadets, they could select from five or six different types of shoes to do all their physical activity in. And they were all of different constructions, different cushioning, different, different materials. And, and what they found was that in the individuals that were able to select their own shoe, to select the one that was most comfortable to them, that they had a significantly lower incidence of stress fracture, a significantly lower incidence of pain. And this is a very subject-specific kind of response because they all picked different shoes that was comfortable to them, okay? <clears throat> um, and then some of our research has shown, you know, when you switch acutely from something like a traditional, a nice cushioned walking or running shoe, to something that's more minimalistic, like a barefoot type, of shoe, and you really put a lot of load on that bo those bones, and if you don't allow time for those bones to adapt, then your risk of fracture shoots way up. So again, if you are switching to a new different type of footwear that maybe is less comfortable to you, 
Focus on increasing that volume instead of intensity. Okay, so that's my time. I'm just going to summarize by saying that, you know, fracture in the simplest of sense depends on just two things, the applied load and the bone strength. And the great thing about exercise and physical activity and staying mobile and moving is that we can prevent fractures through both of these pathways. It gives us two ways to intervene. And then finally, your risk of stress fracture may be reduced. That's the scientist in me hedging a little bit. May be reduced with some simple training rules, gait modifications, and footwear selection. So with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Amazing. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. That's really helpful, especially the Osteoporosis Canada guidelines and, and, and about the shoe, the footwear. So, so important. Uh, and now, it is my privilege to be hosting Dr. Wendy Ward, who will delve into the role of diet in maintaining bone health, particularly as we age. Dr. Ward is a professor and senior research fellow at Brock University in beautiful St. Catharines, Ontario, Niagara region, wonderful part of uh, the province of Ontario. She has made significant strides in understanding the role of nutrition in bone health. In addition to her research, Dr. Ward serves as the editor-of-chief for the journal Applied Physiology, Nutrition and Metabolism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wendy Ward as she shares her cutting-edge research and insights into the vital role of diet in promoting and sustaining bone health. Dr. Ward. Thank you, Lisa. It's a privilege to be here, and I want to thank the McCaig Institute and the Wood Forum. And we're going to switch gears now. We're going to talk about foods and diet, which is just sort of the, the other part of talking about activity when we think about those lifestyle factors that can influence our bone health. So we're going to talk about eating well for healthy, strong bones. So when I think about how do we eat well, or how do we eat a balanced diet, or what does a balanced diet even refer to, I think the best resource we have is to look at our Canada's Food Guide and our Eat Well plate. And you'll all be familiar with this. Our Food Guide's been redone many times, and this is the most recent version that came out in early 2019. And so there's three main focuses of the Food Guide which help us to eat well. And the first aspect is to have plenty of fruits and vegetables. And when they say plenty, they mean plenty. And they mean half of our plate should be fruits and vegetables at each of our meals, or if we're having a smoothie bowl, whatever you're eating off of should be about half fruits and vegetables. One of the other key aspects is to eat protein foods. And that should be representing about a quarter of our plate. It's very interesting with our last uh, food guide, and it certainly wasn't without controversy, when there was a lot of emphasis on plant foods as well. So we can keep that as mi in mind as we go through this talk. The third aspect that's critical is that that other quarter of our plate should be choosing whole grain foods. So those are things to keep in mind when we're eating for health overall. When we're eating for our bone health, uh, again, we want to think about foods first, that foods first approach, but now it gets a bit more complicated because we have a lot of information about calcium and vitamin D and even protein, that those nutrients are very important for our bone health. And now we have to think about, well, what foods are those in or what are our best choices that we can eat? And protein is sort of the more emerging nutrient in terms of bone health. We know a lot about protein and muscle health. And, uh, and activity level as well, and, and the benefits there. And there's a lot of discussion right now in terms of bone health, in terms of amount that's needed, and also source, whether it's animal foods or plant-based foods or mixtures of both that can help us eat well for our bone health. So let's talk first about calcium. And again, you'll, one of the themes you'll, you'll hear coming through as I'm speaking today is I'm very much in favor of that foods first approach. So thinking about the food guide, then thinking about the foods we can consume that are rich sources of these bone supporting nutrients. So when it comes to calcium, we have various options of the foods we can eat. Some are naturally rich in calcium, like our cheeses, um, cow's milk, um, cow's milk based yogurt, and even things like canned salmon. I couldn't find a good photo of the tin of salmon, so pretend that salmon's canned with the bones, because that's where the calcium is. 
Um, we also have calcium fortified foods. So we've got a lot of plant-based beverages that, that many individuals are consuming. And also the, the green yogurt containers I've put there to represent uh, plant-based yogurts as well. And then orange juice can sometimes be fortified with calcium as well. So we have lots of options out there and a lot of the images that I've shown you here are what we would call best sources of calcium. And that's really just referring to the amount, that those are the highest levels of calcium um, in those foods that, that we can get through our food supply. And that's why here I've um, broken it down to best sources as containing 300 milligrams of calcium or more. Good sources are about 200 milligrams of calcium. And then sources are about 100 milligrams of calcium as well. And I followed along with the pamphlet that's been put in your, your bag today. Um, that's been developed by Alberta Health Services, which breaks down and gives you different examples of those foods and the levels of calcium in them. There's also a great resource on the website of Osteoporosis Canada. So Brent just mentioned about the two fit to fracture guidelines. There's also something called the calcium calculator on that same website, where you can enter what you eat during the day and it will calculate how much calcium you're getting. So in terms of um, best sources of calcium, it's a lot of these images of these foods that are representing that. So cow's milk, your fortified plant-based beverages, your yogurts, um, some cheeses will have that high level of calcium. Um, the tinned uh, salmon would be more in the 200 milligram calcium level, and then orange juice would be between one and 200. So there's some kind of simple ways that you can estimate um, how much calcium you need. And in terms of men, between 50 and 70 years, you need 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. This increases a little bit to 1,200 milligrams as you age, simply because we're losing more mineral from our bones with age. And so that dietary recommended intake is increasing. For women age 51 and older, we require that higher level of 1,200 milligrams because we start to lose our bone at an earlier age compared to men. So if we keep that 1,200 milligram number in our mind, then we can kind of roughly calculate how much we're getting during the day. So if we look over on this side, uh, we see something here about 300 milligrams per day from calcium intake from eating a variety of foods. You'll remember earlier I said there's a lot of different foods that contain calcium. The, the issue is those foods can contain very small amounts of calcium, but together by eating a varied diet, you're getting about 300 milligrams of calcium per day just by eating and, and living. Um, and then what we can do is go on and look at our other sources. So in this scenario, I've put down that we're having three of our best sources of calcium. So that might be um, a serving of um, um, yogurt, a serving of cow's milk, and maybe some cheese. So by doing that, we're getting another 900 milligrams of calcium, combine that with the 300 from our varied diet, and we're at 1,200 milligrams. So we're doing well for our, and meeting our needs for calcium for the day. But there can be different scenarios as well. And of course, everybody's got their unique um, ways that they're eating and consuming their calcium. So if we've got the 300 as the baseline, and then maybe there's one food source per day that an individual's eating. And then maybe they know they're not getting enough calcium in their diet, and they're taking a supplement at another 300 uh, milligrams. But the total daily calcium intake is still only 900 milligrams per day. So in this kind of scenario, you might want to evaluate and say, you know, I've got to get closer to that 1,200 milligrams. How am I going to do it? Am I going to increase my supplement use, or am I going to try and incorporate more foods into my diet? So using different resources, like the one in your brochure or in your bag, and also the calcium calculator, you can help to work through and figure out um, how to meet your calcium needs for the day. When we talk about vitamin D, uh, this is one nutrient, and I always tell my undergraduate students here that this is one um, nutrient where you're going to have to take a supplement to get what you need for the day. And that's because few foods contain vitamin D. Uh, the few sources we have are really eggs, and it's mostly in the egg yolk, and there's a little bit in there, about 80 international units of vitamin D or our fatty fish. And we're regularly not consuming a lot of, of the fatty fish to get vitamin D, but they are great sources if you do consume it. We also don't want to rely on sunlight to make our vitamin D. Um, 
For a lot of us uh, living in Canada, we can't make vitamin D even in, um, through skin production and exposure to the sun for six or more months of the year. And also we know that with the, the risk of skin cancer, it's not the best idea to be relying on that for your vitamin D. So this is where you're going to need to turn to um, supplements. We do have some fortified foods and beverages. So uh, by law, our cow's milk, of course, contains a vitamin D. And with the increase in fortification levels recently, uh, milk is now containing 200 international units per day. But when we look over here at what our intake um, should be per day, so for 51 to 70 years, it should be 600 IUs per day and up to 800 IUs per day if we're over age 70. That's a lot of servings of milk. Some of you might like your milk. I do like my milk, um, so I could get close to that. But we know um, that uh, Health Canada has a recommendation that all of us age 50 and over, because of the scarcity of vitamin D in our food supply, should be taking a vitamin that has 400 international units of vitamin D per day to make sure that we're getting enough vitamin D. In terms of types of supplements, this is sometimes a question that comes up. We have the D3 form and the D2 form. So the D3 form is your animal-based form, and D2 is plant-based. And so there's often some concern about, should I take one or the, over the other? Is one better um, than the other for bone health? And I think the latest data is still showing us that there's benefits from both sources. So if you are um, concerned and want to be choosing that plant-based um, form of vitamin D, that's OK. Um, and you will see the benefits to bone and, and your serum vitamin D levels. So when we move to protein again, we're using a foods first strategy. Uh, the dietary recommended intake for protein is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. And this is for all ages. So whether you're a very young adult or whether you're an older adult, it's all the same. I've circled in a green box uh, that 0.8 gram level because it really is a minimal amount. And when I talk to my colleagues that um, work with muscle and looking at protein needs, there's a lot of um, data and literature to support that probably higher levels of protein are needed to maintain muscle um, during aging and muscle function. And that's why I've put those higher levels of one and even maybe up to 1.3 grams per kilogram body weight per day. And that's just sort of to keep in mind that um, two things really, that there may be a benefit of these higher levels for muscle health and um, and also that, uh, you know, I, I, that muscle and bone are working together. And so we kind of have to respect both tissues. Um, and that when we think about supporting muscle and balance and, and training, and that's been talked about in the, in the previous talk a little bit, one of the, the things that muscle or good training of our muscles can do is help us to prevent falls. And if we prevent those falls, we can also uh, reduce the risk that we're going to fracture as well. So I just wanted to put some of those higher levels there just to um, you know, keep in mind the uh, role of protein for muscle health as well. But for bone, right now, we work with this 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight per day. And there's a lot of active studies still um, ongoing about those levels. So if we're a body weight of 60 to 80 kilograms um, and using that 0.8 gram amount, we need to consume 48 to 64 grams of protein per day. And uh, we can look at what that would look like for us. So it's a bit of a busy table with a lot of numbers, um, but I have grouped um, foods according to different characteristics. So at the top here, we have chicken, steak, and ground beef. We have salmon, then we have some dairy foods, Greek yogurt and milk. I had to put peanut butter on because we do eat peanut butter, don't we, as Canadians? Um, eggs, and then I've grouped quinoa, beans, nuts, flaxseed, and I've also put the protein scoops, uh, the pea and the whey protein down here as well. So we've grouped those different types of protein together. And maybe by grouping them, you're starting to think about, oh, OK, these probably have different levels of our bone-supporting nutrients as well, like calcium and vitamin D, and they can vary quite a lot. We're not talking about fiber and fatty acid profiles today, but that's another part of this conversation that can come out when we look at different types of protein as well. 
Um, Because for certain health benefits or conditions, we might be wanting to increase fiber. We might be wanting to alter our fatty acid profile and maybe get more omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. And then what's active in our research program is looking at polyphenols and flavonoids. And of course, those are very much in plants and and tea-based foods as well. But going back to our our table, what I want to focus on is these protein levels in this column and then the energy that's associated with the specific serving sizes for each of these um, types of protein. We'll move on and and do some comparisons here. Because I think one thing you're probably noticing is that up at the top here, we have foods that are much um, greater sources of protein, and then it gets lower as we move down. And then the protein scoops, of course, have higher levels as well. But these different foods have varying levels of, of the protein. And what I wanted to look at in this slide is to compare the chicken steak ground beef and the salmon. So when we compare these, we see that all four of these have very similar levels of protein. But what's really different is the salmon, especially if it's a canned or tinned salmon, is also going to have calcium because you've got the bones being broken up in there. You've also got a really good source of vitamin D in there. You've also got a different fat profile as well compared to the the other meats. So it's kind of an interesting comparison that you've got the same level of protein, but you've got a different um, portfolio of these other bone-supporting nutrients as well. So when you're making decisions about how you're going to get your protein, these kinds of of questions can enter into your decision making. Let's look at another comparison. So here we have Greek yogurt and milk. Of course, Greek yogurt's much higher in protein, so if you are looking to up up your protein um, and you like yogurt, that's an easy way to do it. Uh, And then we compare it down lower to the quinoa, beans, nuts, and flaxseed group. Um, Slightly lower or more in line with the levels of protein in milk here. You've got different um, energy levels, somewhat not terribly different. But a main focus, uh, our main difference in terms of bone-supporting nutrients is this calcium and vitamin D levels that you're going to find in these dairy products versus um, different fat profiles and more fiber in these other options. So again, you know, you're selecting your protein sources and you're going to get very different nutrient profiles accordingly. And the other thing is appetite can decrease as we age. And I see it in in my own uh, family members as well. And so making sure that you're getting enough protein can be really important. When I showed you that earlier diagram that showed the different levels of protein intake, a lot of us as Canadians, as as, um, middle-aged or slightly older adults, are still getting well over that 0.8 grams of protein per day. But as we age, it can get harder and harder to get that level of protein. And one of the reasons is because of our appetite changing quite a bit. Uh, So it's really important to ensure that the protein needs are met. And that might include more frequent snacking and being strategic about what foods we are snacking on, and maybe more frequent, just smaller meals as well. So the last, uh, not really, not a nutrient, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about caffeine because I get a lot of questions about, do I have to give up my tea and my coffee or both, or can I get away with a little bit? Um, and I, so I'd like to share this, this slide. For overall health, we have guidelines from the government that our caffeine intake shouldn't be higher than 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. And in terms of bone health, we are a little bit concerned about caffeine causing us to excrete more calcium, and that calcium is coming from our skeleton. So there can be a little bit of concern there. Um, but what's been shown by the, the literature is that if we stay within the, um, these lower levels of caffeine intake, and we're also getting the recommended level of calcium in our diet, that the two are balancing each other out, and it's fine. And you can, you can have uh, you know, a, a little bit of tea or, or coffee as well. I've put five different tea cups up here in different colors just to show the different types of tea. So, you know, green, um, black, white, oolong tea, they all contain about 45 to 50 milligrams of caffeine per serving. And keep in mind, this is a serving, this is a cup. And I know when we go and get our coffee and tea, it's often more than that serving. So keep that in mind. In comparison, coffee has about double the amount of tea in general. Of course, that's going to vary a little bit as well, but we can keep that in mind. So it's still okay to have, um, you know, caffeine in the diet, provided you're you're getting enough um, calcium in your diet. 
And you know, a lot of people are drinking lattes or they're adding a bit of milk to their, their coffee or their tea, and that's certainly going to provide some calcium that you might be excreting because of the caffeine there as well. And I just a little bit about our, our own research that we're doing back at the university is we're looking more and more at T polyphenols and links to positive effects on bone health. We don't have any cause and effect data at this point, but it's interesting the associations that are out there with these polyphenols that might be acting as antioxidants and maybe have some anti-inflammatory properties as well. And there's also some caffeine-free teas where you're still getting the polyphenols potentially that might be beneficial benefiting other aspects of health. So that's really an active area of research. And rooibos is a great example of a caffeine-free tea because it's from a different plant than our, our black and green and white tea. So just to summarize, you can eat well for your bone health. And I think it's, it's not too difficult. Uh, you can strategize for it and figure out what you like. Because I always tell people, if you don't like what's on your diet plan or your food plan, you're not going to eat it. So you have to make it so you like it. So keep in mind those three aspects of the eat well plate. Uh, make it a habit to eat fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and protein foods at each meal. So think about the distribution of your plate, the half and the two quarters. Um, get your calcium from foods first and supplement only if needed. Um, vitamin D from foods is great, but you're also probably gonna need a supplement as well, uh, especially if we're over age uh, 50. And protein at each meal is really important as well. So a couple of resources. I've mentioned the calcium calculator on Osteoporosis Canada's website. There's also recipes and other resources that are coming online now. I also put together a curated list of websites. It's three pages long. It doesn't look that interesting, but there are some really helpful websites on there um, about Canada's food guides, some information from Dietitians of Canada as well, and, and other um, things. You also have a, a wonderful resource here done by Alberta Health Services called Am I Eating Well for My Bones? And that's been put in your package as well. And that will uh, really help to guide your, your choices as well. I'd just like to close with what's in the little green box at the bottom too. And these were four tenants of the, the food guide. And this really resonated with me. I hadn't seen this kind of messaging before. That we should be mindful of our eating habits. We should cook more often enjoy our food, and eat meals with others whenever we can. And I think that's just a nice holistic approach to healthy eating and overall health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Wonderful reminders of how important it is to be mindful of what we put in our bodies. Well, today we are privileged to be joined by Dr. David Hanley, Emeritus Professor in the Department of Medicine who continues to make substantial contributions at the University of Calgary. After obtaining his MD from the University of Toronto, Dr. Hanley has focused his research on the hormonal regulation of calcium metabolism and osteoporosis. He also founded the Calgary Health Region's Osteoporosis and Metabolic Bone Disease Center, which is now named in his honor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hanley as he shares his in-depth research and insights into the cellular process of bone remodeling and the pursuit of bone building therapies. Dr. Hanley. Thanks very much, Lisa. And, and thank you to the McCaig Institute and to the, the Wood family for this wonderful forum. Uh, and now for something completely different. I have, do have disclosures. I, I've been wined and dined by drug companies in the past. So the, uh, our, I, this has been discussed already, uh, but the, uh, the fact that our skeleton is an amazing architectural uh, achievement because it's also able to renew itself and repair itself. And that occurs through uh, the process of bone remodeling that's been, uh, been mentioned already. Uh, this just shows the, the, part of the pattern of remodeling in two different kinds of bone. This is in trabecular bone, and this is in cortical bone. That's the tough outer shell of bone. And this is surrounded by bone marrow. So 
They, from blood vessels and from bone marrow, uh, the bone, gets, bone cells get signals to either be quiet and uh, do nothing, or else to start re remodeling the, uh, the bone that's there. So at some stage, the bone gets a signal, and in come cells called osteoclasts, which break down bone. And through other signals from the osteocytes, these little blue things here, and from osteoblasts, the lining cells, and, and later the cells that are building bone, the osteoclast gets signals to stop. Other cells come in to sort of lay down a cement line for the new bone. And then the osteoblasts come in and lay down new bone. And they get signals from the osteocytes when to stop. And this is the same process in cortical bone, the outer shell. And as mentioned, bone remodeling has a variety of, of actions. And this, uh, this slide just really illustrates some, uh, and I'm, uh, some of the cells and how they communicate with each other through the whole process. And this is a packet of bone that is remodeling. And the whole concept was introduced by an orthopedic surgeon uh, at, working at Henry Ford Hospital looking at, at uh, biopsies of bone. And he came across the uh, and showed that the process starts with resorption or breaking down of old bone and then the laying down of new bone. And that, that process and all of those cells and the layer and the area of bone that's made is called a basic multicellular unit or a basic remodeling unit of bone. And the skeleton's renewing itself at about 5% per year. And you can look at the skeleton as being made up of about 30 to 35 million of these little packets of bone. So as we slide down the razor blade of life after, <laughs> and, uh, and you've seen uh, a model of this slide before, uh, so men do not go through menopause, and that makes a big difference. So this is what's happening to all of us, unfortunately, a slow loss of, of bone mass. And you've heard some of the methods we can use to, uh, to slow this down, but there isn't really very much we can do about menopause and the bone loss that starts a little bit before the last menstrual period and carries on with a very high rate of bone turnover uh, for about four to five years. Now, obviously, replacing estrogen at this time will, will, very, will limit that, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about uh, estrogen replacement therapy here. But this, uh, when we develop osteoporosis, it's one of these two mechanisms that's probably happening. Either the, the basic multicellular unit doesn't build back quite as much as it took away, or there may actually be a failure of this reversal process and the laying down of new bone. In each case, there's bone loss. In this case, there's a lot of bone loss. And in this case, and we don't know which is going on in each individual person, but this is the case probably for making a major bone building process. Most of our drugs that we use for osteoporosis reduce the rate of bone turnover and maybe reduce the rate of res resorption, and that may bring this into balance. For this kind of problem, you need something to stimulate new bone formation, and we've all been trying to search for a drug that would do that. And so our frontline therapies, as I mentioned, are all anti-resorption agents, basically. And estrogen may, is a very good one, but has, carries with it some bad baggage. The main drug that we use would be bisphosphonates, uh, 
Uh, some of you may have uh, run across Alendronate or Fosamax. That's probably the most popular one. And recently, because of our understanding of how osteoclasts are recruited, a blocker of the major chemical messenger that starts the process of osteoclast recru recruitment and maturation is an effective therapy as well. But the idea is that with anti-resorptive agents, you get a, a maintenance of what we've got or maybe a slight increase. If we had a formation st stimulating agent, we might see a steady uh, rise in bone density. And fluoride was brought forward as the candidate of a bone builder in the uh, 1970s and, and uh, maybe a little earlier. So fluoride has long been known to stimulate osteoblast activity. And when people get way too much fluoride, as uh, is, uh, is fortunately very rarely occurring, but, we, uh, but scientists noted that this was associated with very excessive bone apposition. And uh, one of my mentors, Joan Harrison at the University of Toronto, had a very, she was a, physicist, a medical physicist and used nutrient activation analysis to show that in fluoride-treated patients in clinical trials that were going on at Toronto, uh, she showed increased, cal increased cal skeletal calcium. And early small clinical trials showed promise. So in the mid-1980s, the National Institutes of Health in the United States sponsored two randomized placebo-controlled trials of a high dose of sodium fluoride at two centers in the, in the United States, Mayo Clinic and Henry Ford. And this is what they saw with the bone density. It was amazing over four years, a huge increase in bone mass. But then they looked at fractures, and there were actually more fractures in the fluoride group. Now the choice, the problem with fluoride is the dose. And this was probably slightly too high a dose. And the big problem is, how do you find the right dose? And the problem with fluoride is it's just too hard to do that. These two studies effectively killed the use of fluoride as a treatment for osteoporosis. And at around the same time, people were looking at parathyroid hormone. And a parathyroid hormone is the hormone that pulls calcium out of your bones and maintains your blood calcium. So that might not be a good idea, except we know it stimulates bone turnover. And in fact, in very early uh, after uh, parathyroid hormone was isolated, Hans Selye and uh, uh, Bert Collip at McGill University documented that if they gave injections of PTH in rats, they actually saw more bone. And Chirk Tam at the University of Toronto, uh, uh, working with Tim Murray, did a uh, Chirk for, uh, for, uh, found a, a, a nice method of making human parathyroid hormone and used it in some studies and showed that if you gave the parathyroid hormone as a continuous infusion, you didn't really get much, you got a, a lot of bone resorption going on. But a daily injection increased bone formation much more than increasing resorption. And this was repeated in 1997 by another group in the United States. And again, intermittent exposure increased osteoblasts and bone formation. Small clinical trials were showing increased bone histology and bone density. And then in 2001, a large randomized control trial showed marked improvement in bone density with 18 months on average therapy and significant reduction in fractures. And this is what bone looks like after fluoride or after uh, parathyroid hormone. You can see and these are iliac crest bone biopsies, and you can see the marked increase in bone. So these, we now have two drugs that act 
and are, are approved for uh, osteoporosis uh, treatment. Sorry, I'm hitting the wrong slide here. Uh, teriparatide, which is a fragment of PTH that contains all the biological activity, and a, a growth factor called parathyroid, uh, parathyroid hormone-related uh, peptide can actually do the same thing with a le lesser increase in, uh, in raising uh, blood calcium. These two drugs now have been approved in the United States and, and teriparatide in Canada. Um, it's a daily injection of 20 micrograms and initially approved for 18 months, now good for two years. Abaloparatide is, I hope, waiting for approval in Canada. It's a, a much larger dose because of less calcium activity, and it may even have a greater bone response. I'll just leave this up here for a moment for you to copy down the uh, amino acid sequence of the, the two agents. Um, The other advance that has occurred with the, again, the examination of coupling and the bone remodeling unit and the chemical signals that, I, that keep it moving is another anabolic therapy, uh, which is a, an antibody to sclerostin. And, and this was discovered through examination of families with an unusual bone disease called sclerostosis, and major off overgrowth of bone. And this is a, uh, how, how much the skull from a, a person with one of these disorders has weighs compared to hu normal human skulls, just as an illustration. But the problem with this disease is that there's so much bone that in the skull, it actually starts to cramp off the optic nerve and, uh, and cause hearing loss. So it, it's not a good thing to have, but what was discovered by studying these people and a family of people with uh, very high bone density who were perfectly healthy was a new pathway of activating the osteoclast and with it was a substance called sclerostin, which will inhibit that, that, uh, that pathway. Now the osteoclast, or the osteocyte rather, and the osteoblast uh, are the main stimulator, and the osteocyte in particular stimulates the whole process of bone remodeling. And it puts it in balance by stimulating bone formation, but also stimulating the shutting off of bone formation by, uh, with the, this substance it makes called sclerostin. What has been developed in, uh, by Amgen is a substance called romazosumab, a human monoclonal antibody to sclerostin. So it prevents the activation of the Wnt pathway in bone formation. And three and huge clinical trials have been done with this agent to, uh, uh, and you can see a uh, marked increase in, bo in bone density and a reduction in fractures in, with these, a, a, this agent, which is now in use in Canada. It's a monthly uh, subcutaneous injection of 210 milligrams. It's two injections, actually, at the same time. Now, in one of the clinical trials of this drug, uh, a trial that was comparing romazosumab to alendronate, one of our standard therapies, there were more serious cardiovascular events in, in that trial. In the major clinical trial, there was no increased cardiovascular event. But because of the second trial, uh, its approval in Canada and the United States has a caution not to be used 
uh, in patients who are at high risk for cardiovascular disease. That's remained a controversial point here, actually. But at present, that is the way it, it's currently, uh, currently made available. A recent uh, systematic review of all the osteoporosis drug therapies uh, that we have available found the anabolic agents that I've talked about here are superior to the other therapies in fracture risk reduction, but all of the therapies are better than a placebo. And at present, most of the osteoporosis guidelines recommend the anti-resorptive therapy first, and the anabolics are saved for people who are at extremely high risk for fracture. And after you treat with these anabolic therapies, what happens? Well, as I've pointed out, you've only got a limited amount of time you can take them. Uh, and the bone gains are slowly lost over the first one to three years, and so is the fracture protection. So if you're on one of these drugs for, uh, for bone benefit, you really have to follow it with another drug to maintain those, those gains. And I'll just show you some of the costs here. And, and I think the costs are very unfortunate, and that's the reason they're not really widely used. The uh, teriparatide is, is now generic. The original brand name was uh, uh, Forteo was well over a thousand a month, and in fact, in the United States, it could have been as high as thirty-five hundred dollars a month in some some pharmacies. Romasosumab is $800 monthly. Uh, and neither of these are covered by Alberta Blue Cross, but they are covered by private insurance plans. Teriparatide can be obtained through Alberta Blue Cross through the special authorization program in special cases. But this is what happens when we give, uh, this is a, one of our patients who participated in one of our trials. We followed up the uh, parathyroid hormone with alendronate, and she went from an osteoporotic T-score to a, a normal bone density uh, and maintained it normal for her age. So this is what Osteoporosis Canada's new guidelines come up with. So not everybody needs, needs drug therapy, of course, but, uh, sorry. But bisphosphonates, alendronate, resedronate, or zoledronic acid are the, are the first choice. For people with really severe vertebral fracture problems or, uh, or two vertebral fractures and very low bone density, anabolic therapy would be recommended. So I'll close there uh, and left with my usual problem. The question, we have far more questions than answers here, and I look forward to more develop, developing more uh, newer therapies and safer therapies in future. And right now, I think we still have too much of this and not enough of this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Henley. Thank you, Dr. Henley, and now I'd like to ask all of our guest presenters to return to the stage, and for all of you uh, who would like to actually just stand while we're standing, if you want to just do a quick stretch, um, this would be a great time for that before we have our panel discussion. Exactly. I could lead us in some kind of an aerobics thing, but I'm not qualified, really, so. <laughs> but a good stretch is good as we get ready for our panel discussion. So I guess I'll sit, uh, well, I'll sit here. Perfect. So again, our experts are happy to answer any questions that you may have, but again, they're unable to answer anything that is related specifically for, you know, to medical advice that you might have for your own situation. And if you have a question, if you could please put your hand up and then I believe we have someone roving with a mic. We do. Uh, and we also have a mic up here at the front. Do we have a roving mic, Sandra? 
Oh, hello. Oh, there goes the roving mic on that, that way. We also have the mic up front. And virtual participants, I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, Karen, who is here in the audience too, she is actually there monitoring this right now and they will relay your questions to me as well. So let us begin and let us find out more from our experts here while they are with us. Let's glean more information. Do we have our first, maybe we'll take it from here in the house, okay. All so much for your presentations, they were all great. I have a question for Dr. Ward. I was wondering, so you mentioned a couple times polyphenols and how they're associated with like benefits for bone health. Could you expand a bit more on what you mean by like bone health? Are you talking about density and microarchitecture? Sure. Thanks for that question, and uh, I just wanted to put that in because, you know, we have that half plate, we're reading fruits and vegetables, and so there's a lot of polyphenols naturally in those plant-based foods, and that's an area that we're looking at in our, our research lab, so it's very much uh, exploratory at this point, uh, but what we're seeing in, um, and a lot of it's using um, animal models as well, so preclinical models, is we're seeing favorable effects of increasing the intake of the polyphenols in those animals and seeing um, better bone strength, higher bone mineral density, and better quality bone structurally as well. So we don't know about all the mechanisms. There's a lot of cell studies that are out there, but they're isolated cell studies, so it's just looking at osteoblasts or the bone building cells or the bone breakdown cells, the osteoclasts. And there's um, some ideas that there can be some antioxidant uh, properties happening. So with aging, you can get that accumulation of the oxidant um, stress. Does that help? Thank you. And we'll go on this side of the floor. And Karen, do you have uh, one too? Okay, and I'll, we'll head to the virtual audience after this one. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your presentations. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Ward. On one of your slides, uh, coffee drinking. Uh, caused uh, an excretion of uh, calcium. Could you elaborate on that? Please? Yeah, so caffeine um, can cause us, causes us to um, excrete more calcium in our urine. It's not a huge amount of calcium that we lose in the urine. So it's all about balance. So as long as our caffeine intake isn't too high and we're getting the recommended amount of calcium, the two counter each other, and that's okay. I had put it up because it often becomes a question people hear about caffeine, because caffeine has that effect that it, it makes us uh, pee more, essentially, a, a bit of a diuretic effect. And so that's the, the concern. So it's okay as long as we're within the limits of caffeine intake and that we're getting enough calcium in our diet. Doctor, well, what about decaf? So you wouldn't have the caffeine effects there. So it, does, does, it doesn't even have any caffeine in it? Because I'd heard that maybe it did. Or It, it probably has a, a minuscule amount. Okay. Yes. Okay. Not and I, I think, just to expand on that, there's lots of you know, teas that don't have caffeine as well. So if you are kind of curious about still having a hot drink or some sort of tea, you can, you can do a herbal and not have the caffeine in that. Uh, Karen, how about someone from the virtual world? Yes, I have a question for Dr. Lee Gable. Um, a few people wondered about activities such as swimming and spin class, riding a bike. How does that affect bone building? Right, um, those are great questions. So, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, thinking about bone being squished, swimming, you're floating. So you don't get that type of bone squishing. Cycling as well, you're not weight-bearing. So neither of those activities are particularly bone-building. However, they're great for a whole lot of other reasons. So I think they can become a, a, a healthy complement um, to your overall sort of activity profile. Um, I grew up as a swimmer. Um, maybe I would have included more other activities, um, you know, aside from swimming. So I think cross-training is probably um, important in order to get kind of a, a healthy mix. But um, as I and Brent alluded to, you don't need a whole ton of high impact bone building <clears throat> activities to, to get the benefit. So I wouldn't discourage anyone from participating in, in activities and movement that they like. And from the house, maybe right at the far back there, do we have, uh, here comes the microphone.
osteoporosis and scoliosis? Um, I, that's, a, that's a tough question for me to answer. The, uh, uh, it, it's hard for us actually to use our, our bone density machine uh, or, or bone density assessment on a scoliotic spine. Uh, but to the extent that, that scoliosis develops from a, a muscle imbalance with a neuromus neuromuscular imbalance uh, causing the, uh, uh, the, the change in position of the spine, it probably also means uh, that, that the bone is not getting the same normal uh, stimulus for growth. Uh, and so I would suspect that it probably it may be associated with some relative bone loss. Uh, you know, I'd, maybe other members of the panel, panel have thoughts on that. <laughs> Sorry, that's the best I could do. Thank, thank you, Dr. Hanley, and thank you for your question. And now uh, to the question... Back the mic there. You've got the mic? Oh, yes, you do. Okay. Uh, I have the mic. Okay, okay, can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of you. This is really informative. My question is for Dr. Ward. It has to do with um, what I was told a number of times by some of my medical professionals that when I take my vitamin D and my calcium supplements, they should be taken together to improve absorption and that taking them in the latter part of the day, early evening, is even better because the body is in kind of a slow down motion and you would absorb more as well. So vitamin D is sort of calcium's helper. That's how I think of it, that it helps us use our calcium better and it helps us to absorb in our guts um, the, the calcium that's there as well. And I know with calcium and, and I know Dr. Hanley knows a lot about calcium supplements. I know with calcium supplements, it depends on the form. So if, you've, if you're having calcium carbonate supplements, it's better to have those with a meal when you've got the digestive juices happening to help with the absorption because that form is just not as well absorbed unless you have it with a meal and, and have the, um, the gastric juice and the change in pH. Vitamin D can, can help with that absorption as well. There's other forms of calcium supplements like calcium citrate, which I know you can take any time and without a meal and, and get fairly good absorption. I think one of the things about taking calcium and vitamin D together um, is that you, you're remembering to take take the vitamin D as well. Like I've had a lot of people say to me, well, I forget. So I say, well, have it with a meal because you tend to remember what should be around your, your plate. Um, I don't know, Dr. Hanley, if you have anything you want to add. Yeah, I, I, I think the point about remembering to take, take uh, medicine, medicines or supplements, uh, if any, whatever helps you uh, remember is what you should follow. But really, there's no particular reason why you should take vitamin D supplements with the calcium. Vitamin D has to be converted to a more active form in order to s stimulate bone or, or calcium absorption from the diet. So uh, uh, it really doesn't matter what time of, of day you take the vitamin D supplement. Amar, okay, yes, right here. Thank you all very much for your contributions today. I've learned a lot. And this is a quick tie-in with another vitamin D question for Dr. Ward, I guess. Um, I'm wondering if there is an upper load of, uh, or an upper limit to vitamin D. We have heard sometimes about uh, vitamin supplements. Um, there can be too much of a good thing. So I'm just wondering if there is an upper load, uh, upper limit rather, and would it affect the um, calcium absorption um, negatively in any way? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really nice question. There are upper, what we call upper tolerable levels or ULs for all our nutrients. So just like we were talking about recommended levels, there are these upper limits that we shouldn't go beyond. And vitamin D has one as well, because we know at that point, we're not getting any additional benefit for health outcomes. And in fact, we're getting into potential harms. So that's the, the transition that's happening there. 
And because I'm under pressure, I'm drawing a bit of a blank, but I think the number is 4,000 international <laughs> units as the upper limit for vitamin D. But in saying that, I'm certainly not advocating that people be taking 4,000 IUs per day. That's just been determined as the upper tolerable level um, for intake. And certainly, you know, I mean, our current guidelines now and, and in the newly released guidelines that Dr. Hanley was referring to um, were the... Um, the thought is, is to have as much vitamin D rich foods in your diet as you can. And then when you're over age 50, and those new guidelines are for individuals 50 years and older, is following Health Canada's guidance that anyone over the age of 50 should be taking 400 IUs of vitamin D per day, which is far, you know, much lower than that upper tolerable level. But you make a very good point about supplements and that you can easily get to levels that could get you in a a range where you could be getting negative effects on your health if you're taking too much. So I always say, be careful. You know, supplements are, they're in a drug level at that point or, or can act like a drug if you're taking enough of it and really jump up your levels. You're certainly never going to overconsume nutrients from foods, from food sources. And that's where a lot of that food first approach is, is coming into play. Thank you. If I could just add something oh, to that. Sorry, I, Dr. The, uh, uh, we just completed a, a clinical trial here of in in healthy people over the uh, up under the age of 70, but uh, over the age of 55, uh, testing 400 units a day versus 4,000 units a day versus 10,000 units a day, uh, and all, up, all of those levels were basically safe, although there was more problems with. A, a blood calcium going a little high with the 10,000 unit, uh, unit dose. But what we found was there was uh, no bone benefit. Uh, the 400 units a day for normal healthy adults maintained a normal bone level of, of vitamin D in the blood. And the people who were on the higher doses actually in using a very, Dr. Boyd's very sophisticated method of measuring bone density, they actually lost bone compared to the people who took 400 units a day. Now, we didn't see more fractures or anything. We don't know how significant that is, but there certainly was no benefit. Uh, and, uh, and then I would just echo what Dr. Ward said. Uh, Dr. Edwards, uh, it's safe to say I'm going to ask you a question about this micro trauma that I probably have in my bones right now. Uh, how, uh, I know, and I have a teenage daughter, and I see that there's a lot of stress fractures actually that we are seeing in, in this teenage age group in the track and field world. And I'd just love to know is it really just as simple as just don't train as much? Like, how can we, or somebody like myself who ha maybe has like a stress fracture, is there something you can point to to how to prevent that from happening? <clears throat> if you haven't had one yet, I wouldn't really worry about it. Okay. It's the people, because, you know, one of the highest uh, risks for having a stress fracture is having already had a stress fracture. And then, a, uh, and then where you see a lot of stress fractures um, <clears throat> are in uh, in people participating in endurance activity and and that's where energy availability becomes a really big important issue and so and so at, at that point it really be, becomes important to ensure that you're you're having adequate intake of calories to be able to repair the micro damage mm -hmm. you know that you're getting um, and then the other thing to think about with these you know stress fractures is um, they rarely, if at all, happen without some kind of prodromal pain. You have a hot spot in your shin, you can feel it coming on, but you work through it and you try to work through it. And, and I guess the best advice I could say is, is uh, listen to the language of your body. That's probably the best way that you can try to prevent one of these things because mm -hmm. they don't just happen out of the blue. You'll feel them coming on and so if that does happen, Pickleball? It's harder it to rest if you're on a track and field team, right? Right, yes, right. And <clears throat> pickleball, what about pickleball? Is, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I could probably dig through the literature and find an incidence of one stress fracture from a pickleball player. <laughs> but he probably just did way too much pickleball too soon. soon. 
So right. focus on the pickleball volume, not the pickleball intensity. <laughs> right, which you did stress in your talk. Yes, okay. How about a virtual question? We have just a couple more minutes, actually, but a virtual. Yes, I have another question for Dr. Brent Edwards here. And somebody is wondering about the current trend to have a very high and thick cushion in running shoes. And wouldn't be less squishy be better for um, osteoporosis? Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> we could get into a very nuanced discussion here about where the risk of a stress fracture come from. The, you know, there's camps that believe it happened when you hit the ground, when your heel hits the ground and, and you get this, this impact that occurs. Um, but I think now what we know a lot more about loading of the skeleton, and what we know is that the primary loading on the skeleton comes from muscle contraction, and it doesn't come from these external impact forces. And so, um, so the, 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 the latest evidence is suggesting that no, it's not bad to have these uh, cushioned running shoes, and even these heavily cushioned running shoes like, like Hoka. I think one of the more interesting questions um, moving forward is, is actually around these new super shoes that people are wearing, the people that are breaking these world record distances, and, and those have a lot of cushioning as well. But it's not necessarily the cushioning in that shoe, they have carbon fiber they have carbon fiber plates that run along the length of these shoes, which makes the shoe bend much less. And if the shoe doesn't bend, then it means that it's hard for you to flex the bones in your foot, which means that the bones in your foot experience more load. And so one of the questions, and this is like early, early days, but one of the questions is, are we going to see more stress fractures or overuse injuries and people wearing these new super shoes. And I, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that yet. From the front here. Hi. Um, this question is for Dr. Gabel. Um, I'm just wondering about if estrogen is still available for bone building in young women that um, take contraceptives, especially the ones that um, reduce menses or eliminate it altogether. Yeah, and actually that's a really interesting discussion. And, um, it's actually really hard to infer if somebody is regularly menstruating if they're also on oral contraceptives because that's not a true menstrual bleed. Uh, so we can't use a menstrual cycle to, to gauge menstruation the same way. Um, the, the contraceptives typically used, oral contraceptives, are a combination of estrogen and progesterone usually, and so you do get some of that estrogen. Um, so um, yes, there would be a bit of estrogen there. That what, what has been shown is um, with some of these very low dose estrogen pills and contraceptives that perhaps is not great for bone because they're not um, providing estrogen to the same extent that would be provided during a normal cycle with the estrogen produced in the follicles. So. Um, uh, oral contraceptives, the safety of them ha has been widely studied. Uh, in general, they're quite safe, but there is an issue potentially with these very low dose estrogen pills not supplying enough estrogen. Thanks. We have one at the back, I see, or just right here. Okay, and then maybe one at the back, and I think we're in our timeline here, I think. So one here and then one at the back. And maybe if we have time, we'll squeeze in a virtual. Okay. Okay, good morning, and thank you so much. How informative and, uh, yeah, very exciting information. Thank you so much. Just a couple quick questions. One for Dr. Ward, and I was just wondering, I really enjoy a latte, which has lots of calcium. Just even one cup is good enough, but what about a soy latte? I wonder if you could uh, say something on that. And also, what are your thoughts on adding Mediterranean salt and Celtic salt to some of our foods just to, because it's got all the, the minerals or more minerals than the calcium and vitamin D. So I wonder if you could address that, please. And also, Dr. Edward, I wonder if you could uh, speak on um, a boxing program versus a weights program, just if you've got some thoughts on that. Thank you. So to answer your question about um, so in your latte, having a soy um, beverage in there, or you know, however much you want to use in there, that if it's, if it's a fortified source of, of calcium, it will 
work the same way as cow's milk will and provide you know, the calcium. Because a lot of the products that are out there, I sometimes go through and check in the, the stores, the f level of fortification is very similar to, to cow's milk in a lot of those products. But you have to check the product you're using or where your favorite coffee tea place is. Yeah, that would be fine. Now, about the, the salt and the minerals, I'm not familiar with that at all. Um, and I know sodium can be, you know, we've got to watch how much sodium we're getting in our Canadian diets. So I, I'm one of those people, actually, that doesn't really use salt at all because of I know I'm getting enough and my family's getting enough just with eating out or, you know, processed foods that creep into the diet. So I'm sorry I can't really answer that part. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. So thanks for that question. I was going to show a figure with a bunch of athletes and, and it was sort of cross-sectional, different types of athletes and how much bone mineral they had. But I knew that Dr. Gable was going to do something similar. But the graph that I was going to show uh, didn't have boxers. It had mixed martial arts uh, <laughs> athletes. And they have some of the greatest uh, bone mineral density of, of any athletes. I'm not telling you all to go out and start doing mixed <laughs> martial arts. <laughs> But it's probably not the mixed martial arts. It's probably not being in the octagon that gives you the good bone health. It's the cross training and the jump roping and the skipping and the variable loading. And, and what's also important for bone building is, is short bursts of impulsive activity, right? Some of the people who have the best bones are people that do Olympic weightlifting. And so what do they do? They sit down in a chair and they do nothing. <laughs> For like 15 minutes, they do nothing. And then they get up and they lift like 200 kilograms and they do it very impulsively and quickly. And then they go and they sit back down for like 15 minutes. That's some of the best things that you could do. And gymnastics is kind of like intermittent bouts of them. And so I think when you do boxing and mixed martial arts, there's probably a lot of that, which is good and healthy. Yeah. Thing. One at the back really quick and then one here. And then I think I'm kind of getting that Okay. Yes, at the very back. Yes. Yeah, so when it, yeah, there's a lot of interest in that, and I think we don't have a really good answer on that. But having said that, there are populations throughout history that have consumed plant-based diets, and the bone health isn't standing out as a, a problem. So I, my advice would be to try and work with a registered dietitian. And I'm sure they can come up with a plan so that you're meeting all the targets that you need to. Because for sure, you're going to have to be more strategic in terms of some of those nutrient choices. And that's what you're, you're sharing with me in that question. That would be what I would do is, is work with a registered dietitian on that. I don't, don't think there's anything that's completely transferable for you to work on that diet per se, I think it'd be best to use the clinical resources that are there. Yeah. Yes, yes, and that's, yeah, I like where your thinking's going in terms of, you know, energy and, and the ratios with other nutrients. Thank you, and in the red jacket, yes. Thanks so much. I'm sure I speak for everyone saying that all of the presenters were phenomenal. It's such a pleasure to hear the practical sort of side of things and have you take your science and bring it to us in a way that's approachable. So thank you to everyone for that. Um, Dr. Ward, I just wondered, I love seeing you know the food first approach highlighted on your slides and the recommendations about cooking skills. And we know that that's something that's really disappearing across our landscape and um, in our Canadian practices. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on sort of culinary medicine and teaching kitchens and that work and whether or not that's a value to our populations to try to reinforce some of these concepts you were teaching on today. I, 
Yeah, I love that idea. And actually, I was just Googling some teaching kitchens that are in the US right now and being incorporated into university training and clinical training. And I think, I think we need more of it. We need more of it. I mean, I was in that group where what we learned in, uh, on the Ontario curriculum was how to make mini pizzas in food economics, you know, grade seven and grade eight. Um, and that's great, but not an everyday food, right? <laughs> so I think we need to build those skills right from when kids are young and getting kids, even if they're chopping vegetables or we're helping to prepare meals in the kitchen, and it's hard. We have busy lifestyles. And the last thing you want to do is put more pressure on families. There's enough pressure and guilt and all that. So I think the more we can incorporate it throughout our life as a skill we can pick up, the better. Here, yeah, thank here. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. To those of you who are joining us online, thank you for your questions. A huge thank you to our speakers today for sharing your cutting research. Yes, yes. And insight. I think we can all agree that we are so much more fortunate for having been here today to have picked up all of this information that we can then take to our own lives. Also, a wonderful thank you once again to Dr. Donna Wood, uh, your family, Mrs. Southern, and the, Woint, and the Wood Joint Research Fund for enabling us to continue these truly valuable public events. And this event is also supported by the Alumni All Access Partnership Fund, and you can visit them at their booth in the lobby. And if you would like to learn more content, learn more about the McKaig Institute, stay in touch on, oh, there we go, on social media. You can find them on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and you'll receive as well an online survey in the next few days about this event, and we would love your feedback. That allows us to make these events that much better. Also, if you haven't already, I invite you to visit our community partners at their information booths on either side of the lobby. There they are. And that concludes the formal part of our Wood Forum 2023 program. Thank you again as well to Maven Media uh, for your support of this. It was wonderful to work with you. And also, Science in the Cinema, there it is. Now you're thinking, what is this? Well, as you can see, November 22nd at the Plaza Theater, they're going to be screening Big Hero 6. It's called Science in the Cinema. And this is a free all ages event and it will feature a discussion with our researchers post film exploring new medical technologies for improved healthcare delivery. Plus, and is it on there? Oh, I think it might be. Oh, plus they'll delve into the transformative role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in remote healthcare. So this is very going to be very interesting. So November 22, 6 p.m the Plaza Theatre that is down in Kensington. And last but not least, thank you again and you online for coming today. Please do mark your calendars and join us next fall for Wood Forum 2024. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you.